Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship here at Bethel Church. My name is Matt Benton. I'm the pastor here at Bethel, and it is my joy to welcome you to worship on this beautiful fall Sunday morning. If this is one of your first times worshiping with us here at Bethel, whether in the sanctuary or online, I want to say a special word of welcome to you. Thanks for stopping by the church on the corner. Here at Bethel, love is our mission. We're about loving God, loving one another, and loving our neighbors. I have a few announcements this morning um, because next week is going to, or next weekend is going to be a busy weekend here at the church. Um, but before we get there, if you're normally a part of the Wednesday Bible study that George leads, um, it's it's not going to happen this week. Um, so you will just have to. And, uh, anticipate its next uh, meeting, but uh, I think it got put on the schedule for the upcoming week. Just a heads up, they're not going to meet this, this week. Um, next weekend, um, there is going to be a yard sale and vendor blender out in the pumpkin patch, so come on by for that. Uh, and then next Sunday, our, uh, our men's group is going to feed us not once but twice. I know, I can hear you. I, yeah. Uh, because there's going to be breakfast in the morning, and then after church uh, uh, next Sunday is going to be our annual chili cook-off uh, to coincide with the Washington Commanders. You know what, guys? They're going to try really, really hard against the New York Giants, and we, we, just, we just hope for a little bit better than we got a couple Thursdays ago. Um, so bring your appetites, um, and, uh, you know, I'll I'll preach next Sunday until you get hungry again. I'm just kidding. I won't. I'll preach the normal amount of time. Um, <laughs> if no one shows up to church next week, we know why. It's <laughs> There's going to be a lot of events going on in the pumpkin patch over the next couple weekends, and so you can take uh, a look at your bulletin for those. Um, and uh, just wanted to give one quick reminder that if you're baking cookies for Kairos, um, which is a prison ministry um, that is similar to Chrysalis and Emmaus, um, but they, they bring a lot of cookies. Um, so if you're baking cookies for Kairos, those need to be in by next Sunday. Um, Rich will be collecting them then. And, you know, if you're baking and you just want to throw in an extra dozen for the pastor, I wouldn't say no to <laughs> extra cookies. Um, those are the announcements for today. Uh, so would you stand as you are able for the call to worship? Rejoice in God always. Again, I say, rejoice. Take heart, the Lord is near. Make it known among the people, God reigns. Proclaim it from the rooftops. Let gentleness and mirth be your guide. Rejoice in God always. Again, I say, rejoice. Take heart, the Lord is near. Would you pray with me? Almighty and all in God, we know that in drawing us to this place, you have come near to us. And so we come here this day to rejoice, to rejoice in your love, to rejoice in your grace, to rejoice in your mercy. Meet us as we worship you, that we might leave here to love others as you have loved us. Through Christ our Lord we pray, amen. Our opening song is Gather Us In, which you sing with us. Yeah. 
Please join me in the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed, in your hymnals, UMH 881. Check to make sure it's there. <laughs> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now. Be seated. Our scripture reading is pretty special. It's printed on some nice, fancy, shiny paper. That's how I know. Our first reading is from Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 14. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off all the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, 
formed it in a mold and cast an image of the calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once, your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen many people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them, and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains? and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever." And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. This is the word of the Lord for the people, Lord. Thanks be to God. I know there's some children in the house. Come on down. Good morning. Hey. So last week when we were here, we heard the passage from the Bible that's the Ten Commandments. It's got ten most important rules. And most of the time we put our most important things first, right? So what was the first things that God said? You shall have no other gods except for me. You shall not make idols, and you shall not bow down to idols. And you know what the weird thing is? The passage of Scripture that we just heard read, it comes after God gives God's ten most important rules to follow. And you know the very first thing that God's people do after they get those ten most important rules to follow? They break rules one, two, and three. They make for themselves an idol. They have, they decide they want other gods except for, uh, besides our God. And they bow down before their golden cow and worship the golden cow. Now, what I find important about this part of this piece from the Bible, this story from the Bible, isn't so much that God's people broke the rules. What I find most important is that God still loves his people anyway. He's not terribly happy with them at the time. But they're still God's people. God is still with them. God still loves them. And throughout our lives, we'll try our best to follow God's rules. I try my best. I'm sure that you try your best to follow God's rules or follow your parents' rules or follow school rules, follow all the different rules you get. From time to time, you follow your school rules. I know you do, buddy. But sometimes, there might be times when we break the rules. Sometimes we won't mean to and we'll do it. 
Sometimes we feel like we don't know what the rule is and we get in trouble. Or sometimes we know we're breaking the rule and we do it anyway. But what is most important about that isn't that sometimes we'll break the rules. What's most important is that God will never stop loving us. No matter what, God will never stop loving us. And so we still try to follow the rules. It's not like, well, God's, not, God's never going to stop loving us, so let's break whatever rules we want. Because when we love God back, we want to do what God wants us to do. But God will always love us. And that's the most important lesson we can learn from that story. So let's have a prayer. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us when we try really, really hard to follow your rules. And thank you for loving us even during those times when we break your rules. Help us to love you the way that you love us. Help us to try really, really hard to do what you say. And help us to love others the way that you love us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, y'all can go back to your seats or out with Miss Patty at the Children's Church. Uh, and would you all stand and sing the wedding banquet? seated. (laughs) 
I invite you to hear now the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had invited, been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroying those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you pray with me? Almighty and all in God, in calling us to worship you this day, you've already spoken to each one of us. So Lord, as we turn to your word, read and proclaimed, we simply ask that you continue speaking, and that you give us eyes to see you and ears to hear. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last weekend, I was channel surfing when I saw that one of my cable channels was showing an Ocean's 11, 12, and 13 marathon. And I knew what I was doing for the rest of my Saturday. Has that ever happened to you? When you're channel surfing and you find a movie in the channel guide, and in that moment, you realize that your cable TV has chosen the perfect movie for you. It's actually one of my favorite experiences of having cable TV. My cable TV just knows better than I do what I want to watch. I say all that because the Ocean's movies are nothing if not movies of surprise. But I imagine many of you know this. I know that often my cultural references, my TV references, are decidedly obscure. But Ocean's Eleven was a massive box office remake of a Rat Pack movie that spawned multiple sequels. And like any good heist story, it involves over-the-top characters, a lot of misdirection, and surprise after surprise. Which means if this week's parable is any clue, Jesus would have been a fan. Jesus tells a story of a king who is planning a great wedding feast for his son. Now, this would have been the royal event of a lifetime. Plans would have been in the works for months, if not years. Literally, no expense would have been spared. Not only would the king have wanted to celebrate his son, but royal weddings are an opportunity to show off the glitz and the glamour, the power and prestige of the kingdom itself. Simply put, this royal wedding was going to be a spectacle. The guest list would have been a who's who from as far as messengers could travel. Other kings and princes, the rich and the famous, they would have been invited months out. And if you were invited to this wedding, you would have cleared your social calendar in order to attend. Nothing would have been more important than turning up for the great royal wedding feast. I mean, saying no wouldn't have been an option. Everyone who is rich and powerful would have been in that room. And so every person who thought themselves rich and powerful clearly would have wanted to be seen in that room. If you weren't seen in that room by all the other rich and powerful people, well, then clearly you weren't as rich and powerful as you thought. There's no way that if given an invitation to this wedding feast, that you would say no. Because to say no, not only would be 
hurting yourself socially, it would be a horrendous affront to the king as well. You'd be showing him up publicly. It would be such a blow to his honor that he would have no choice but to respond by coming after your honor. No one would get out unscathed. So it was the smart thing, the strategic thing, the prudent thing to say yes and to go. And this is precisely when the unspeakable happens. The caterer, knows, or the caterer needs to know how many fillets and how many crab cakes to make, so messengers are sent out one final time to get RSVPs and meal choices. And invited guest after invited guest after invited guest all suddenly say, we cannot come. We're not coming after all. We've got affairs to manage. We've got cows to milk, tents to make, money to count. The king can't believe it. It would have been a shock and scandal for one invited guest to turn down an invitation to the royal wedding, but every single guest? This is beyond the pale. The king will have no choice but to respond in some way. He would have to do something. He has just been shown up by society writ large. The king has no clothes. The rich and the powerful of the land have just said so. To do nothing would be to cement this opinion. So the, this needs swift rectification. So the king displays incredible power and might, swiftly bringing violence upon those who have dishonored him. But then there is the little matter of what to do with the wedding feast itself. Although, frankly, it's no difficult matter at all. You see, it's very simple. You cancel the feast, of course. We would expect that a king whose honor had been so offended, a king who had been so embarrassed in the court of public opinion, would need to save as much face as possible by first seeking vengeance upon those who wronged him, and then secondly, canceling the banquet. You certainly wouldn't invite new guests. The only thing worse than throwing a banquet that no one shows up to is throwing a banquet that the wrong people show up to. But in Jesus' story of surprise, the king sends his servants back out into the streets to find anyone and everyone to come to the banquet. The king invites beggars and the poor and the nobodies to come to the social event of a generation. The king invites the riffraff and peasants to come enjoy the spoils of the kingdom. This is bonkers. No one would do this. And yet somehow this is what this king does. So the king is enjoying the festivities when he sees one of his newly invited guests wandering around improperly dressed. He orders the man seized and said, how did you get in here without the proper attire? This poor man doesn't really know what to say. I mean, wasn't it obvious? He didn't have the proper attire on because he couldn't afford the proper attire. He had the clothes on his back and that was it. Where was he supposed to get proper dress for a royal wedding on no notice, by the way? And even if he could find it, how is he supposed to pay for it? Surely a king who would send his servants out into the streets to invite anyone they saw into the wedding feast would understand that. But somehow the king doesn't. He orders the man taken away and thrown into the dungeons. This story is wild. This story is crazy. None of it makes any sense by any norm or custom of the ancient world or our world or any world in between. No one says no to going to a royal wedding. No king, having been scorned by the rich and powerful, would invite the poor to the feast. And how does a king who invited people literally from off the streets into a fancy dinner somehow enforce a dress code? What is going on here? Why would Jesus tell this strange story? What is the point of this very weird parable? This story illustrates that the kingdom of God is full of surprises. This story reminds us that our lives of faith don't follow any societal norm. Jim didn't know what to make of this young man who was walking into his Tuesday Bible study meeting. The regular attenders of the Bible study were all retired, gray-haired, long-term members of the church. And the church membership as a, as a whole was a small group of retired, gray-haired, long-term members long-term members. But in walked a man in his late 30s 
long, greasy brown hair, multiple piercings and tattoos, dressed more for a night out at the club than for an hour in an old church building. But Jim wanted to be hospitable, so he walked up to the young man and introduced himself. The young man shook Jim's hand and said, my name is Dieter. I know y'all don't know me, and it probably seems weird my just showing up like this, but you knew my grandfather, Rob. He used to come here every week to this group. Jim's eyes lit up with recognition. Of course, Rob, we love your grandfather. He's been a member here forever. I haven't seen him in a couple weeks, though. Do you know how he's been? We've been praying for him. Dieter's eyes watered for just a moment, and then he smiled and looked away and said, well, that's the thing. He died a week and a half ago. Jim's stomach sank. How would they not know? Jim looked at Dieter and said, I'm so sorry to hear that, son, and I'm so sorry we didn't know. Your grandfather was an amazing man, and we loved him a whole lot in this church. You know if there's anything that you or your family need, we're here for you. Dieter gave a nod of recognition and said, I appreciate that. And, well, that's kind of why I'm here. Look, I haven't always lived the best life. I've, I've had some troubles. I gave my parents and grandparents a lot of grief. But no matter what, all throughout my life, my grandpa was the one who was always there for me. By now, some of the other members of the Bible study group had wandered over to listen in on this conversation and see what was going on with this young man. Dieter continued, About a year ago, I'd fallen on some hard times, but my grandpa was there for me, as he always was. I'd been living with him this past few months. He let me live with him while I found a new job and got my life back on track. He was always talking about this church and how much this group meant to him. He really loved this place, and I knew it was so important to him. I've been a mess since he died. I really don't know what to do anymore, but I figured if God was so important to my grandpa, Maybe I could come down here and and y'all could help me find this God who might be able to help me figure out how to move through this. Dieter was finished, but no one quite knew how to respond to him. Eventually, Jim said, so you've, you've come here to ask us to help you find God? And then without missing a beat, Kathy said, do we know where he is? But if Jim was surprised to have met Dieter that day and the conversation that ensued, Jim was floored the next week when Dieter came back. After Dieter's declaration the previous week that he was there for help finding God, the Bible study went on mostly as usual. They picked up where they'd left off while Dieter sat mostly quietly in the circle. When they left, Dieter, or Jim wished Dieter well, but figured he wouldn't see him again for a while. But then Dieter came back. Week after week, Dieter became as regular a presence at the Bible study as his grandfather had been. He'd ask questions, he'd make comments. Sometimes he'd just sit for long stretches, listening. He'd share about his life experiences, and he seemed to deeply take comfort in just being in a place that had brought comfort and peace to his grandfather. The Bible study had been making their way through the book of Acts. One day, they read the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. It's another crazy story full of surprises. One of Jesus' apostles is going down the road when he sees a foreign servant trying to read a Bible. The apostle goes up to the servant and says, what you got there, buddy? The servant held out his Bible. The apostle saw that he was reading from the book of Isaiah and said, what do you make of what you're reading? The servant said, it's Isaiah, I don't know. No, the servant said, how can I know what I'm reading if no one explains it to me? The apostle then explained how Isaiah was talking about Jesus and how Jesus was crucified for our sins and was raised from the dead. And because Jesus is risen, we can have hope for eternal life with God in Jesus Christ. The servant listened to all of this and said, how can I join in? The apostle said, will you become baptized? The servant said, there's water right over there. What's to stop this from happening right here, right now? And the servant was baptized. Dieter listened to this story and the discussion that followed. Toward the end of the hour, Dieter cleared his throat and said, Um, what is baptism exactly? Like most of the times Dieter spoke in this group, a beat of silence answered his question. And then someone said, 
Is there a hymnal around here? Maybe we can look there. Someone found a hymnal and turned to the liturgy for baptism and read aloud, Through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. Then Dieter said, cool, what's that mean? Different members of the Bible study started chiming in. Baptism is getting to join God's family. You're part of the whole big church. We are washed of our sin. We are born again. We become part of what God is doing to save the world. God says that we are his child. Dieter took it all in and said, so what do I have to do to get this? Do I have to like give to the church or something? Then Kathy said, I don't think you have to pay money. I mean, it says right here that all of this is God's gift offered without price. Dieter said, wait, so so I can just do this? And then all of those things you said, they'd be true about me too? And then Dieter broke down in tears. Kathy walked over and gave him a box of tissues while Jim rubbed his back. Dieter composed himself and said, I'm sorry, it's just, throughout my life, it was only ever my grandpa who had made me feel loved and accepted just because. With everyone else, I felt like I always had to earn it. And if I stopped doing what my parents thought was right, what my friends thought was cool, they'd leave me. Or if I screwed up or lost my job, my girlfriend or my friends, they'd leave me. I always thought it was weird that my grandpa never left me, that he never seemed to love me any less, even when I was at my lowest. And then when he was gone, I thought that was gone too. I figured I'd have to earn people's love and acceptance or friendship for the rest of my life. And it just felt so hard. It felt so exhausting. But then I came here, and I know I freaked you all out, but you didn't tell me to go away. You just let me keep coming, which I thought was weird, but I liked it. You put up with my dumb questions. You listened to my stories. You really seem to care about me. But now you're telling me that God is like this too? That God loves me too no matter what? That I can be part of all of this forever and I don't have to do anything? I don't have to try to fit in? I just get to be here and part of this and part of y'all? It's just, it's too much. Kathy smiled a moment before she said what she was thinking. Hey, Jim, I think we just found God. Our God is a master of surprise. God comes to us in love. God reaches out to us in grace. God welcomes us with mercy. God claims us even in those moments when we want to run from ourselves. God is with us even when everyone else has gone away. God is for us even when we work against his purposes. Through our baptisms, we have been surprised to be invited to the great wedding feast of the Lamb, the social event of eternity. Not because we are so rich or so powerful, not because the event will be enriched by our presence, simply because God wants all of us, every one, to celebrate the riches of his mercy and grace. But to properly enjoy the feast, we need to continually clothe ourselves with God's love and God's grace. We need to clothe ourselves with the righteousness of Christ, leaning not on our own ability to cover ourselves, to make ourselves presentable, but rather allowing God to surround us with grace through Christ. Our God is a master of surprise. He has come and rescued us, brought us into the great feast of his love that we might delight there forevermore. All this is God's gift, offered to us without price. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now would you join us in singing, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. Thank you. 
Please be seated. Now it's time for us to share a little bit of our bounty that the Lord has given us. Would the ushers please come forward?
Would you pray with me? Almighty and all of in God, we give you thanks for all the ways in which you have blessed us with your life and with your love, with your presence in our lives. As we return some of these material blessings back to you, we pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit and the ministries of this church, others might come to know that by your great mercy, they are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. They are called to delight in your love They are called to the heavenly banquet. All this we pray through Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. As we turn now to a time of praying for the needs of the church and the world, we give thanks to those of you who were Christ's hands and feet out in the world this week. For whom else are we praying this week? Would you pray with me? Almighty and all loving God, we give you thanks for those moments, for those those glimpses we get of your, your great wedding feast, the glimpses we get of your kingdom here on earth, the glimpses we get of you working in this world. We thank you that we can come to this place week after week to be met with your love and to be met with love and acceptance from others. In a world where we continually struggle with loneliness and alienation, help us to go out, to go out into the streets, to go out to all our community, to our neighborhoods, to meet others in love, to meet others in acceptance, to meet others with the grace and compassion that we have found here. But God, even as we get glimpses of your presence with us, this week we continue to see images of a world still in need of salvation. Just as we can see the kingdom of heaven here on this earth, too often, God, we can see hell on this earth. And so we pray for places where violence is reigning. We pray for Israeli and Palestinian as they experience untold violence and untold loss, as fear clouds out any hope of a bright future. We pray for those in the Ukraine who continue to struggle We pray for all those who simply seek to live in peace, to live in harmony, to thrive. And yet whose lives seem crushed under the weight of the powers and principalities of sin and darkness. We pray for those who are sick 
that they might receive healing. We pray for those who are grieving, that they might be comforted. And God, on these crisp mornings when we go outside and realize that the, the weather is turning colder, we pray for those in our community who are unhoused, who are housing insecure, who don't know where their source of heat will come from, don't know where their source of food will come from. Help us to reach out in love and compassion that the peace we long for, the peace we crave to see worldwide, we might be part of making here in our home. We lift to you all that th- those that we have spoken in this place, those that are on our church prayer list, those requests that come in through digital means, and those we love who we've kept to the quiet of our hearts. We know you are here, God. We know you are continuing to invite more and more into the great feast of your love and mercy until your kingdom shall come on earth as it is in heaven. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, as we pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is 10,000 Reasons. Would you stand and sing with us?
As we go from God's house out into God's world, I invite you to receive these words of benediction. Bear witness to the love of God in this world, so that those to whom love is a stranger will find in you generous friends. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.